Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to everyone's favorite day, Friday. Um, yeah, Friday. So today we will, what we'll, we'll do, uh, we'll, talk, we'll continue talking about Cuban Missile Crisis. We will, um, I've got some video to show you and then I think we have got some reading to do as well. Uh, I might let you out just a little bit early um, because I have a phone meeting that I should, I was going to skip because it starts at 9.30, but I think I'm going to join it because it's an important one. So I think I'll just let you go a few minutes early if, if that pleases the court. Sure it, does. <laughs> it does please the court, okay. Um, so we'll do that. Um, I mailed out most of the history grades and comments yesterday, I think. Um, I, I, I think there's one person I might have missed because they contacted me this morning, so I'll have to sort through my emails and try to find their paper because sometimes they get lost in the shuffle. Yeah, I, unfortunately I get a large amount of emails and so things get buried in my inbox very quickly. And so, um, yeah, I'll have to just dig back and, and find it. So I think there's one person that I still have to mark because it got lost, so I'll, I will do that today. Um, but I hope everyone is okay with what they heard and saw. I know, Aliana, you're still looking a little disappointed, but it'll be okay. Um, yeah, and, and the, the audio comments are still working for people? You just, <laughs> okay. That's okay. Um, I don't know, I, I, I really like those. I really like, I like the audio comments. They're much easier for me to do and, and I think that gives you more information too, so that's the important thing. Okay, um, let's say hi to who's here. So Helen's here, good morning, and Ananda's here, good morning. Uh, Michaela's here, hello Michaela. Uh, Ayushi's here, good morning. Kevin is here, good morning. Ashley is here, good morning. Shania, hello Shania. And Hadil is here, and John is here, good morning John. And also John is here, good morning John. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Okay. I have something I'd like to discuss with you, but maybe I'll discuss it with you just a little bit later. So we'll see if more people will sign on. Because I'd like to have a I'd like it to be a little more of a group group thing. Okay. That said, let's go back to the Cold War. And so um, when last we spoke, we had just finished with the Polish, um, Poland gained some reforms from the Soviet Union. They sort of demonstrated, um, they demonstrated and they made a big fuss and Khrushchev was almost ready to go in with the tanks and then he decided, you know what, I said there were many roads to socialism, you know, we'll allow some limited economic reforms to the, to the Polish um, communist system. The Poles were still communists. They were still loyal to the Soviet Union, at least within the Warsaw Pact. And so Khrushchev kind of lets them have a, a little a win, right? Poland gets a little win here. But the same will not be said for Hungary, right? Hungary wants more freedoms. They are protesting more strongly. And then, of course, as we know, Imre Naj, the leader of Hungary, will propose the withdrawal from the Warsaw Pact. And that will be that's a non-starter, as they say, for Khrushchev. He rolls in with the Red Army, squashes the, the, squashes the revolution. Imre Naj is taken away and executed later on, and they install a brutal communist dictator in his place, right? So, yikes, ouch, right? That hurts. Um, but of course, in the process of that, we learned that um, these Eastern European countries are, of course, still strongly nationalist. They are not really united in, you know, as a communist bloc so much as they've had communists imposed on them by the Soviet Union and the Red Army is standing by to roll in should they want to divert from communism, right? So that much is clear. But of course we see, <coughs> pardon me, we also see that the Soviet Union is committed to maintaining this Eastern Bloc of countries, this kind of buffer between the West and themselves. And, but to keep that, they may have to allow some mild economic or social reforms going forward, right? As long as these countries don't ask for too much, right? Which Hungary does, right? They overplay their hand to use a, uh, 
card playing metaphor, right? They overplay their hand and it doesn't turn out well for them. Um, oh yeah, I wanted, to, I wanted to show you this because around this time, maybe I'll come back to this because they'll talk about it, um, they'll talk about it in the video. So I'll come back to the Berlin Wall, but um, the video I'll show you here very shortly is um, a computer generation of what the wall would have looked like um, kind of in the 1980s. And so it's pretty intense. It's a pretty intense wall, but we'll come back to that in just a little bit, okay? I don't know that any, um, yes, some parts of the wall are still standing. So there's parts that are kind of, you know, in memoriam kind of thing. Um, but a lot of it was destroyed when the wall came down in 89, I believe. And um, there was lots of pieces floating around. For a while, you could buy pieces of the wall on eBay. I don't know if you can still find pieces of the Berlin Wall. I don't even know how you would no, well, I don't know if you could, you know, determine that it was from the Berlin Wall, but for a while you could buy pieces of the wall on eBay. What's that? I, I don't know that you could, yeah, you couldn't authenticate the pieces now, so. I'm not even sure you could figure out how old it is. It's not that precise, unfortunately. Radiocarbon dating is radiocarbon dating is not that precise, depending on the sample. Plus, for radiocarbon dating, you need um, organic material. Yeah, yeah. R radiocarbon dating has to do with living carbon, so you need something. You need something that was alive. So you need bone or. What they do, so in the case of a vase, as an archaeologist in a previous life, what they do with a vase is you, um, you would try and date the layer it was found in. So you would try and find something organic from the same layer and date that, and then kind of make the assumption that the vase comes from the same time. Or uh, ceramics can be dated, I think, with um, a method called electron spin resonance, or maybe thermoluminescence. I've kind of forgotten. Both of those are kind of complicated, uh, complicated sort of um, lab techniques. What's that? They are uh, electron spin resonance. Um, I actually forget what that is. And same with thermoluminescence. I forget how those work. Um, most of my work was done with radiocarbon dating, so I know it better. Fossils can be done. Um, Fossils can be done with um, something called potassium argon dating. What's that? Uh, the, the, uh, potassium argon dating can be done with certain rocks. And so uh, I think thermoluminescence can as well. But radiocarbon dating requires organic material. And it actually it only goes back to about 40,000 years or so. Because it has to do with, um, it has to do with the sort of, uh, I guess, radioactive decay of carbon 14 ions to carbon 14 at, or carbon 13 atoms. And so that happens at a predictable rate over time, but eventually there's no carbon 14 left. And so you can't, you can't date it anymore. And so the limit is about 40,000 years for, um, for radiocarbon dates. Uh, but yeah, there, there's a bunch of, there's some other, there's a suite of other methods you can use. Um, that allow you to date things that are not organic or that allow you to go back further than 40,000 years. Um, but those ones I'm not too familiar with because I, I just dealt with, um, I just dealt with um, radiocarbon dating. You can also, sometimes with human genetic material, you can use mitochondrial DNA um, because the, you know what a mitochondria is from biology? Mitochondria have their own DNA sequence, interestingly enough, and the Interesting that the, the mutations in mitochondrial DNA seem to um, seem to the, the, their DNA seems to mutate at a predictable rate. Strangely enough, so you can compare populations and kind of count back the mutations, and you can you can get a time estimate from that as well. 
um, for kind of they've used it for um, kind of human populations leaving Africa because humans evolve in Africa and then we kind of branch out to other parts of the world and so they've used mitochondrial DNA to figure out well you know when do people start leaving Africa and when do they arrive in the Middle East and when do they arrive in you know South Asia and so on so they, they can use that too but I've um, yeah uh, those those methods I'm not entirely familiar with yeah there we go dating yeah 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 dating tips but not not those dating tips archaeological yeah, dating other oh, dating <laughs> tips the ones that the ones that archaeologists are interested in uh, okay uh, what's that he's a he's a paleontologist um, so yesterday we talked about um, the Cuban Missile Crisis right and we said that Khrushchev had ordered the um, the construction of these medium-range ballistic missile sites in Cuba. Cuba, of course, had just had its own communist revolution where Fidel Castro had overthrown Cuba's prior dictator, Fulgencio Batista, I think his name was. Um, and Khrushchev does that, of course, because, well, number one, he's helping out a communist ally, which the Soviets are always ready to do, but also he gets to put missiles right in the U.S.'s backyard, right? And so that will give him a kind of position of power to negotiate. He still wants the, he still wants the, um, he still wants the Western powers out of Berlin. And so he decides that he's gonna put these missiles in here. Uh, but unfortunately for, unfortunately for Khrushchev, um, the Americans find out about it. And so this, as far as I'm aware, is actually the satellite not satellite, the, the photographs from the reconnaissance flights. So, well, A, this is prob they probably had a much higher resolution picture of what this was, right? This is a small version. I think that the film that they shoot this on is really big, like the film is really large, so you can actually zoom in and see detail. Um, the other thing is that these guys know what they're looking for, right? These are top, top intelligence FBI and CIA kind of guys and military, military experts, so they can tell what a missile site looks like. This doesn't look like anything to me. Um, but this is, this is the photo. This is where the Americans fly over Cuba and say, oh boy, Soviets are installing missiles right next door to us. Bad news, right? Um, right. No, we didn't, and I meant to talk about that. Um, I meant to talk about that prior. So, um, after after Fidel Castro overthrows um, Batista's regime, um, the U.S. is interested interested in overthrowing Castro because Castro. They know Castro is a communist. They don't really like the idea of a communist nation right next door, and so they try to overthrow Castro. So they collect a bunch of Cubans who have since emigrated to the United States, they organize them and they get them to land in Cuba with the hope of hopefully finding their way in and overthrowing the government. Um, right, so that group of, of um, of invaders that are gonna try and overthrow Fidel Castro's regime. They land at, in Cuba at a place called the Bay of Pigs, um, but the, I, I don't know why it's called the Bay of Pigs. Maybe, maybe that's where pigs are shipped into Cuba, I don't know. <laughs> it's called the Bay of Pigs. They, they land there, they try to you know, find their way into Cuba, but the operation is poorly planned. There's no air support. It's a disaster, it's an embarrassment, um, and so, yeah, so, th so that doesn't look good, right? The Americans try to invade Cuba quietly to overthrow Castro. Doesn't go well. Castro is probably not happy. Um, brand new President John F. Kennedy doesn't look very good. And uh, yeah, so that happens. And then we have this, right? And so we said that during the Cuban Missile Crisis, there were a few different positions on what to do, right? And so they were all kind of metaphorically categorized in terms of birds, right? And so we had hawks, and what were the hawks 
advocating for? Hmm? Yeah, the Hawks were saying all out attack. The, the Soviets are building missile sites in Cuba. We got to go in there and bomb those sites and destroy them, right? Aggressive, perhaps effective, but aggressive. Okay, so those are the Hawks. Who else do we have? Right. So the, the, the doves, the sort of metaphorical or the symbolic bird of peace, some people in Kennedy's administration wanted to sit down at the table and s let's work it out, right? Let's have a group therapy session, as you say. Let's talk it out. Let's resolve this with our, let's use our words, right? Let's use our words. And then there's these owls, right? And owls are kind of the symbolic bird of wisdom, if you will. And what do the owls want? What's that? They're in the middle, right? And, and let me say that one more time. Right. So they're going to use, they're going to use the military to, again, quarantine the island, to quarantine Cuba and make sure that no Soviet ships get in to deliver those missiles. And then they're going to tell the Soviet Union to stand down, right? You are not installing missiles here. And so, tense, right? There's a tense week or so where, again, and, and I, maybe you'll see this in the video, but I don't think the book does a very good job of saying how tense this actually is because nobody knows what's going to happen, right? We've got American warships lined up outside Cuba. We've got yeah, Soviet ships headed to Cuba with nuclear missiles on board. We've got submarines, Soviet submarines supporting them and probably American submarines floating around at the same time. What's going to happen, right? What if, what if somebody fires at someone else, right? It, then what? Is it a declaration of war? Should you use a nuclear weapon? What if they use one first? What if the Soviet ships just don't stop? Are we going to let them go? Are we going to crash into them? Are we going to torpedo them? Like what, what's going to happen, right? And nobody's entirely sure how this is going to pan out. But there are, a lot of, there are a lot of nuclear weapons in play, and these two sides are headed directly toward one another, right? So it's a super tense, super tense period. The US has bombers in the air all the time with, loaded with nuclear weapons ready to, ready to fly to wherever. So super, super tense. And actually, as a little added bonus, um, Canada's involvement um, yeah, Canada has a, Canada almost has no role to play. But during this period, apparently, um, the Americans had asked the Canadian government if they could land their bombers, their nuclear bombers in Canada and to, to sort of refuel and to get ready to maybe fly to Russia or to wherever else. And Canadian government said, no, we said, we don't want to be involved. Keep your bombers on your own soil. Um, and, and that actually didn't go over very well with the Americans. We kind of, no, they didn't, but they, they were angry at us for a little while because we didn't, didn't let them land. Anyway, uh, added, added tidbit. So of course, how does this thing get worked out? Well, as you read about yesterday, um, it kind of gets worked out in the background. And so We've got two leaders on TV, and I think you might see some of that in the video. Two leaders on TV talking to their nation. And both, both leaders are saying kind of what they have to say to their, to their country, is that we're not backing down. We're not going to be pushed around by the Soviets, or Khrushchev is saying we're not going to be pushed around by the Americans. And so both leaders are kind of speaking with some rhetoric, right? They're like, we're not going to back down. We will not allow the Soviets to, you know, directly threaten the United States like this. And, um, you know, Khrushchev is saying we're not going to allow the Soviets to, or the, the Americans to push us around either. So there's a lot of tough talk, right? And so for the people of both countries, there's probably some unease, right? And unfortunately, neither of these guys are talking to one another. And that's a bit of a, that's a bit of an issue, but fortunately, somebody is, right? So the Attorney General of the United States, who is now uh, William Barr, frighteningly, uh, but at the time was um, 
Kennedy's brother, Robert Kennedy. And Robert Kennedy manages to sit down with Anatoly Dobrynin, who's the Soviet ambassador to the United States. They manage to sit down and hammer out a deal. And so thankfully, somebody's talking to someone here because outside of Kennedy and Dobrynin, you know, there's a, there's a showdown you know, unfolding in front of us, right? And so really without the efforts of these guys, it could have gone a lot differently, right? It could have gone, could have gone very different. What's that? Yeah, it could have, it could have gone, could have gone boom, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of potential for things to get out of hand when nobody is entirely sure what's happening and everyone's got their finger on, on the button, right? There's lots of things can go wrong. Attorney General is kind of like, um, kind of the head of legal, like the legal department of the United States, if you will. I, I don't know how to define it very well. Yes, yeah. Here we have the same thing. Here uh, in Canada, we call them Solicitor General. Yeah. And so, uh, do we? Yeah, I think it's Solicitor. I think it depends on the. Depends on who you're talking about. I think the, who does Canada have? I think Canada has Solicitor General and then provinces have one as well, but it depends, the, the name can change depending on the province. So Alberta has a Solicitor General here in, uh, Can or here in BC we have an Attorney General. But yeah, they're <coughs> basically the, yeah, District Attorney or Crown Prosecutor for the entire province or country, right? And so. Um, these two guys sit down, they make a deal, they say, hey, we will we'll pull our missiles from Cuba. Actually, they, the, the original deal doesn't really offer that, but, they, um, but, but it happens later anyway. The U.S. Agrees, agrees that they will not invade Cuba and they will allow Fidel Castro to do whatever he wants, although they stop, um, they stop trading with Cuba. And they basically cut off all ties with Cuba after this, after this, um, after this event. And actually, not until uh, it's Obama, it's Barack Obama who goes back to Cuba in I think 2012 or 14 or something, and kind of makes this historic visit to Cuba and reestablishes rela a relationship with the country. So, for a long time, Cuba's cut off from the United States. Um, but yeah, these two manage to, to work it out, right? Um, one of the questions I asked you yesterday, and let me just um, let me just pull this up here. Let me just pull this up. Whoops. Okay. I'm not sure if I asked you this, but let me ask you now. What, what lessons does the United States learn from the Cuban Missile Crisis? What do they learn? Right, so well, one of the things, I guess this is more question 31, but we'll, maybe we'll just deal with them all together things that come out of the Cuban Missile Crisis, if you will. So one thing is a hotline from Washington to Moscow, right? So they install this, I think it's a red phone, I think it's an actual red phone, and it's a direct line from the White House to the Kremlin, right? And, huh? Does it exist? Does it what? Does it still exist? Is it still there? I doubt it. Maybe it's like a museum piece. Well, I don't know. I think, I think they have more direct methods or, you know, newer methods of contacting one another now. I'm, you could probably just like, you could probably like WhatsApp Putin. Yo, Pooty, what's up? Kagadi Allah, no. Um, yeah, I don't think he's a what, I, he, yeah, he's probably more of a Snapchat guy. Even the pigeons are saluting.
Putin and Russia, hey? I have not seen that. Um, okay, so we've got, this, we've got this direct link between Moscow and Washington, right? And that's important because, again, during this whole crisis, we had two powers who were not talking to each other, who had their fingers on the nuclear button, wondering what the other one was going to do, right? This is a recipe for disaster, and the fact that nothing came of it is a miracle, right? So again, it's good for these guys to be in contact so that <clears throat> if there's any confusion about what's going on, Kennedy or Khrushchev or who's ever in charge can pick up the phone and say, hey, what's going on? Are you guys testing a nuclear weapon? You know, is there a Russian plane flying toward us? What's going on, right? Because you can't have, can't have miscommunication when there's this much on the line, right? And so, yeah, they install a direct line between Moscow and Washington so that these two can, you know, talk to each other and at least iron out any misunderstandings, right? What else comes of this? Or what else is learned? Yeah, something comes out of this. What's it, what's it called? Salt comes later. So that's strategic arm, arms limitation talks. Those come later. I think that's the acronym anyway. What's that? The that comes, that comes a little, er uh, I think that comes earlier as well. The, the mutually assured destruction, or maybe it comes later, I forget. Um, what do they come up with? They, they, start, they start doing talks on non-something. Start doing talks on non-something. Yeah, non-proliferation. So what is, what is any, any ideas what proliferation means or to proliferate? Huh? <laughs> no? No, 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 no. Something proliferates? No, no. Uh, when something proliferates, it kind of like spreads, right? So if you have mold in your house, if you don't clean up the mold, it will proliferate. It will spread all over the place. And so here, when they're talking about non-proliferation, they're saying, we don't want this technology to spread. We don't want other countries to get their hands on it. Because as the te textbook describes it, and I can't, I can't imagine that this just occurred to the Soviet Union and the U.S. in this situation, but wow, nuclear weapons are really dangerous. And if we start using them, a lot of destruction could occur. Maybe it's not a good idea for every country in the world to have these weapons, right? So they start doing talks on, on non-proliferation and um, bans on testing, and eventually they come to um, a treaty, a non-proliferation treaty that countries can sign on to so that they don't they agree not to develop these weapons. And you know, some of you might say, of course, that's a good idea. And some of you might say, well, why on earth would anyone want to sign such a thing? And countries have varying responses, right? So a lot of countries sign on and agree not to develop nuclear weapons. Some countries, of course, do not sign on and proceed with their own nuclear program. Um, but <clears throat> at least it's a step to try to limit this technology, right? So the US and the Soviet Union say that they're not going to test, <clears throat> they're not going to test nuclear weapons anymore. They're not going to sell this technology or provide it to other nations. And lots of other nations agree that they're not going to develop this technology either. And Canada is actually one of those. Canada signed on and we have never developed nuclear weapons and we don't have any, which I am thankful for because we don't need we don't need those we don't need those things, um, so yeah. So we've got non-proliferation talks and testing bans. We've got the the hotline from Moscow to from Moscow to Washington. What else comes out of this in terms of lessons learned or otherwise? <coughs> lessons learned. H how does this thing actually get solved? Military force and threatening? Uh, well, there's a little bit of threatening, but how does it really get solved? Like, so what happens between the, the Kennedys, the other side, and the other one? 
Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's diplomacy, right? So diplomacy works. Sitting down and actually talking to the other side is a good thing. Even if you don't agree with the other side, even if you don't like the other side, there is a value to actually sitting down and trying to work things out. It's a far safer method than threatening each other with world-ending weapons, right? And, and it seems like you shouldn't have to say that, but apparently you do, right? Threatening each other with world-ending weapons is a bad strategy. Sitting down around the table and trying to work out some kind of a compromise is much better, right? And so, again, both sides learn that there's a value to diplomacy, there's a value to keeping the lines of communication open, right? And I think, um, I'm not sure about Trump because he's all over the place, but um, other presidents have followed that fo followed that pattern as well is that you talk to everyone right you talk to your friends but you should also talk to your unfriendly countries as well right even you don't have to like them or agree with them but you keep you keep talking right you keep talking because that keeps things from from going sideways if you will <laughs> um, anything else to learn from this there's something about face face. Yeah, so there's something about allowing your opponent to save face in order to kind of resolve a situation. What does it mean to save face? As in F-A-C-E. What does that mean? It's kind of a, it's kind of a saying. But we don't use it that much anymore, but it's, people would know what that means. Never heard it? What's what? The saying is to, to save face. What does it mean to save face? To what? To what? No, well, well, yes. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, to, to kind of save their dignity, right? To keep them from being humiliated. And so allowing your opponent to save face, allowing your opponent to back down or step back in a way that isn't humiliating is beneficial, right? Because you know, you, you can't have kind of a no-win situation, right? You can't have, you know, the Soviet Union and the Americans threatening each other with nuclear weapons and nobody's going to back down. And the person who backs down is a weak, spineless, you know, wuss. Yeah, you can't have that, right? Because nobody, nobody's going to back down in that situation. And it's too, again, it's too dangerous. So you have to find a way where, yes, they can both kind of, oppose each other, they can sit down and talk, and then they can come out of that meeting and say, you know, we've had a meeting, and this is what we've agreed to. Boom, 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 the end, right? And nobody has to, nobody has to lose, right? No, there doesn't have to be a winner or a loser, because again, the stakes are too high in this game, right? We're talking about weapons that can pretty much end human existence. The stakes are way too high for, you know, a decision to be made based on someone's dignity or pride, right? It's too much. So there's a value to talking it out. There's a value to communication, but there's also a value to finding a compromise and making sure that no one, you know, is humiliated or embarrassed by compromising, right? And so both of these, um, both of these um, guys, Khrushchev and um, Kennedy get to step back from the edge, right? Step back from the edge of confrontation. And, you know, nobody gets hurt, but nobody, you know, nobody's humiliated either, right? Nobody, nobody really won or lost. I think everybody won, actually. <laughs> the earth won, <laughs> but really nobody lost that, right? They were able to, um, to resolve this difference without anyone being the clear winner or the clear loser. Um, although the Soviets, I think, are going to take a different line. They're going to, the Soviets are going to feel like Khrushchev backed down too easy. But that's their, that's their business, right? Um, anything else? Anything else that was learned from this? Or actually, let's talk about the two results. 
I'm not sure if the phone was one of them, but let me just check here. Let me just check my slides. Ah, there we go. Okay. So, whoops, that's not right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So there's some other things here. So lessons learned. The, the negotiations, the diplomacy was helpful. But of course, we, al we also learned or kind of confirmed what we already knew, that the UN was useless in this situation, right? Both the Soviet Union and the US are on the Security Council, and so they can veto each other. And so the Security Council can do nothing. What does it mean to veto? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Veto, veto. F for those of you who are in my comparative cultures class, veto comes from um, the Roman Republic, and it's a, the Latin word or Latin phrase. It means "I forbid." You, you may not do this, and so to have the power of veto means that you can stop things from happening. You can't necessarily make anything happen, but you can stop something from happening. And so, the president of the United States has some veto power as well. So if Congress passes something, he can veto it, he can stop it. Um, but here on the Security Council, we have both the Soviet Union and the US. And so even if the Security Council decides, you know, we're going to put sanctions on the Soviet Union or we're going to assist the US, the other side can veto it and nothing will happen. Right? So. Um, the UN is, is useless in this regard, right? Um, again, the value of diplomacy and allowing the opponent to save face, that's learned. And the Americans also learned that their commitment to NATO and Berlin must be strengthened, right? So they come out of this trying to make sure that Western Europe is even stronger than it was before. Um, so two outcomes, two outcomes, maybe three. The hotline is one of them. The beginning of nuclear non-proliferation treaties is another one. And then there's a third one. Uh, the hotline. The hotline is one. The beginning of nuclear non-proliferation treaties is number two. And then the third one. We've kind of already talked about this, but maybe we'll talk about it again. Okay. Um, yeah, I, th I think maybe the third one is this, and, and, and the fir the, it's the, the awareness of the vulnerability of a world dominated by nuclear powers. And again, I kind of feel like, you know, they should have clued into that a little bit earlier than the minute before they thought they were going to destroy each other. I think it should have been more apparent earlier, and it probably was, but... The book does, the book does say this, and so we'll go with it, right? Um, and the X Men never showed up. Disappointing, right? Yeah, Magneto's thing. He was too busy trying to kill that other guy, though, to pay attention to what was going on. <clears throat> Plus, Magneto's not really. Well, yeah, he's a he's a complicated he's a complicated character. Mm hmm. All alrighty, Rue. What's that? Um. Yeah, I put I put that under the last one. I put that under lessons learned. But I think both of these questions are kind of similar in that this is things that come out of the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? Whether they're lessons or whether they're Results, or I, I think they're kind of the same thing here. So I, I'm okay, kind of mixing them, mixing them together. Okay. Now, before we have a break, I just want to talk about one thing. Okay. Now, let me just pull up, let me just pull up the thing that I'm looking for. Okay. Um, right. 
So there it is. Mm -hmm. And the value of diplomacy is definitely another one, yes. OK, here's what I want to talk about. So when we started this course, I, had, um, I, I put this on the syllabus. So you should probably recognize that from the, the first day or the second day I posted the syllabus for you uh, on Student Portal and on Microsoft Teams, I think. And this is kind of how I imagined the course to go, OK? And as it turned out, a few things didn't quite work out the way I thought they would. And so I thought we would do a few more reflective activities and um, uh, I thought we'd do some more reflective activities. And as it turned out, we kind of didn't. There didn't, s what's that? Well, that was the thing. We kind of didn't quite get to them. Um, and so, you know, that had to do a little bit with, with time and, and marking time and other things. And so we didn't kind of, that was something I meant to do that we kind of just didn't get to, okay? Uh, and so we, we've got something that we need to do with, with that, but I'll press pause on that for a second. Uh, the second thing that we have to, or the second thing that was a little more complicated than I thought it was going to be was the attendance and participation thing. So we've kind of got people who are, you know, in class and then out of class. Some people are online, some people are overseas, and it's kind of a little more difficult to keep track of attendance or it's more, it's more difficult to sort of evaluate participation than maybe I thought it would be. And so here's what I propose to do, okay? Um, here's what I propose to do. I would like to, basically for attendance, I would like to give everybody 100% on attendance. And so I'll just assume that everybody showed up. I think next term I might not do attendance because it's just too, like I might not give an attendance grade because it's just too difficult to keep track of. Um, but I, I think for this term what I'd like to do is just put 100% in everyone's column and leave it at that, okay? So that's the first part of my proposal. The second part of my proposal is that, again, we've got these reflective activities that are supposed to be worth 10% and they are, they don't exist, right? So we've got to put that 10% somewhere else. And the, the reflective activities, because there were none. So we've got to do, we've got to do something with that. No, no, that I can't do. So we have two, we have two options here, I think, okay? And the first option is this. The first option is this. Um, we take that 10% and we move 5% of it to the quizzes and 5% of it to the micro papers. So the micro papers will be worth 30% and the quizzes will be worth 25. Okay, that's option number one. Option number two is that I can move the I can move the full 10% to the quizzes and make the quizzes worth 30%. However, if I do that, that's a lot, right? That makes the quizzes worth a lot. And so in that case, I propose to, we'll have four quizzes by the end. We've got one more quiz to do. I will only take the marks from three of the three best quizzes of yours. So the fourth, w w the, lowest, the, lowest quiz, the lowest quiz mark I'll throw out. And it will only be the, the, the three highest ones. So we've got, so, it, so I think this is what I propose. I propose 100% for attendance for everybody, and I propose either um, splitting the 10% for the reflective activities and putting it half on quizzes and half on micropapers, or I propose putting the full 10% on quizzes, and in that case, I would take your three best quizzes and throw out the worst quiz mark. Um, Michaela asked if there'll be another quiz before the final exam. Indeed there will, Michaela, and I think I would like it to be, um, I think I would like it to be on the Monday of the last week of class. So, yeah, not, not, not Monday, 
Yeah, that's Monday the 30th. Where's there's no, there's no final exam. She's saying, there's, is there going to be another quiz? Yeah. So, yeah, so, so Michaela, I think, yeah, I'd like to do one more quiz, and I'd like to do it on the Monday of the last week of class. And that's the, is that the 30th? Is that what that said? The 30th of November? Let me just check one more time. Yeah, it's the 30th of November. So I'd like to do the last quiz then. Um, yeah, so, so those are the two, the two options. And either, either option contains the 100% attendance. The question is, do you want 10% on the quizzes, or do you want to split that 10% between the quizzes and the micro papers? So here's what I'll do. Let's take a, let's take a short break, take a 10-minute break. When we come back, you can tell me, you can think about it, and then you can tell me what you think, and we'll do a little bit of a, we'll do, we'll do kind of a vote, okay? In a, in a democratic fashion. Okay, take 10, we'll come back, and we'll settle this, okay?
Good. Hello, we're back. Sorry about the delay there. Uh, we were just talking about university transfers and stuff like that. So we had a choice. We had a choice before us, right? And the choice was, um, the choice was because we. I should go back to this here, because we didn't really get around to reflective activities this term, and because our attendance was a little bit tricky to monitor because people are kind of in and out of class and are overseas and sometimes have um, sometimes have internet problems and so on and so forth, I proposed a solution. And my solution was A, that in either case I would just make attendance and participation 100% for everybody. And the second thing that I proposed, or the second part of that, was that we would take that 10% that was from reflective activities and put it somewhere else. And so the first option was to simply take the 10% and put it onto, um, onto the quizzes, right? So that the quizzes would be worth 30% rather than 20. And the second option was we would split up that 10%, five would go on the micro papers, five would go onto, um, onto the quizzes. Now, if we put the, 10, the full 10% on the quizzes, I also said that I would take your best three quiz marks and throw out the fourth one, throw out the worst the lowest one. So obviously this is going to work a little bit different for everybody considering on what your marks are, right? Some, some, one option might work really well for one person, the other option might work better for another one. But I would like to arrive at a single, a single option. And so um, here's, what we'll, here's what we'll do. Is this a Word document? OK, good. Um, here's what we'll do. So option one, um, um, sorry, I probably should have, I probably should have typed this out earlier. Tennis at 100% and, um, whoops, 10% weight to quizzes. What's that? I already have 10%. You already have 10%. <laughs> um, OK, and option two, so attendance at 100% and 5% weight to quizzes, 5% to micro papers. Whoops. OK. Those are. Those are our two options, OK? Um, now, again, like I said, everyone's going to be just a little bit different, and things might work slightly better for one person than the other. I had a quick look at my mark sheet, and the way it looked to me is that, on average, the micro paper marks are higher than the quiz marks, OK? And so I think what would probably work better for the average person is to take option two. Because again, the, that will make the micro papers worth 30% of your grade. And again, on average, those grades are higher. So I'm thinking that they will pull you up more than, than will option one. Because again, the, the quiz marks are lower. And even if I throw out your, even if I throw out the worst quiz mark, it may not be enough to move you significantly one way or the other. So I'm, I kind of feel like option two is the better one. But that's for you to decide. And so what I would like to do now is I would like to do, um, I would like to do a little vote, OK? And so what I'll do is for those of you who are online, in the live chat, um, type in the option that you want. And from the people who are in the room here, I will you know, take a quick show of hands. We'll add it up, and we'll see how it turns out. OK, um, one last question I'll answer before, um, before we go to the vote. Whoops, we already got a vote. Um, is do we have a final exam? There is no, <coughs> pardon me, there is no final exam. There's just the final paper, Michaela. OK, so votes are coming in. So as the votes come in here for option one or option two, um, I will take a show of hands in the room here. 
Uh, are, you, are you ready to vote? Very well. Um, okay, all in favor of option one. Who would like option one? Ooh, one, two, three for option one. Um, who would like option two? Two for option two. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna, so that was, um, that was three for option one, two for option two. I'm just gonna wait a few more minutes to, or another minute or two to see if more, um, if more votes come in and then we'll figure it out. As I say, it doesn't much matter to me. I'll just rig my spreadsheet one way or the other and it will do it. So, <laughs> so vote for vote for what you want. Option one or option two. Democracy at work, right? What if you come to a tie? Good question. What, what do you think is a, what do you think is a, what should we do if we have a, a relative tie? I've done these kind of things before and usually there's a bit of a, you know, there usually there's a bit, there's a preference for one or the other and I usually go for it. But if it's kind of, oh, for each person? I don't know. Rose, you voted twice. <laughs> yeah. You're not allowed to. You're not allowed to vote twice, Rose. You're in the room. You can't be online and in the room. Illegal votes, voter fraud, voter fraud. What's that? I know she's she's Russia in this scenario. She's messing with the electoral system. Okay, um, let's see what we have here. Uh, okay, so for for so the total number of votes for option one is four. The total number of votes for option two is seven. Six. <laughs> Six. So um, it looks like option two. It looks like option two wins. Well, and, and this, is the, this is the thing, right? Is that democracy requires the consent of the losers, right? It's unfair. It's, every, every single person did not vote, exactly. but every single person who is here voted. And so, again, we've got, we've got a six to four split, which is... 60%, that's a lot, the, the presidential election was a lot closer than this. Um, so I think that's what we'll do. T to be honest, everyone's gonna get a little bump up. Well, some people are gonna get a bump up from the attendance. Everyone will get a bump up in one way, in one way or the other, right? And you know what? Since it's close, since it's close, I will, if it's, if it's okay with everyone, we'll go with option two. But I'll also do the quiz thing where I throw out the worst one. Okay? So the people, the people who chose option one or, and sort of didn't win here, they get a little piece of what they wanted to. Okay? So that's what we'll do. So we'll modify this. The micro papers will be worth 30%. Attendance will be worth 10 as it always is, but everyone will get 100. Reflective activities, scratch. Those are gone. Quizzes are now worth 25%, but I will take the best three out of four. And your worst grade, I will throw out. What's that? In a way, you have both. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I will do. Fair? Okay. Good. I'm glad we got that. I'm glad we got that resolved. What's that? I should have went with a right-wing dictatorship, but those are, you know, as we've mentioned, those things, you get things done really quickly in a right-wing dictatorship, but it doesn't mean everyone's happy. So I think, 
I, I, that's true, but I feel like everybody feels reasonably good about this accommodation. Okay. All right. Um, again, and, and you know, that's the problem with democracy is it sometimes you don't get what you want. Sometimes the person you voted for doesn't get in. Yeah, it's frustrating, right? But that's, that's how democracy works. If you refuse to, if you refuse to concede defeat, that's not democracy, right? That's authoritarianism, which we're almost seeing a little bit of in the United States. But fortunately, the authoritarian is incompetent <laughs> and, and ill-prepared. But, you know, imagine how dangerous he would be if he was actually on top of things. Yep. He will, he will remain president until, I believe, January 20th, at which point... The con and I think it's at noon or something like that, but the Constitution states that he ceases to become president and the president-elect, who is now Joe Biden, becomes president and is sworn in. Wait, so Joe not no, no, he's, the, he's, the, he's called the president-elect. And so he has no authority yet. Trump is still the president until January 20th. And then he will, he will cease to be president. Huh? I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not, well, again, Trump, Trump will create as many problems as he can on the way out because that's just who he is. But again, and I'm not an expert here, but the thing is, is that the, the transfer of power is, the, the, the legal requirements are enshrined in the Constitution. And constitutions are not easy to change um, because they're, they're the highest law in the land, right? They're the, they're the rules of the game for playing for playing the game of the United States, the Constitution says this is how you play the game. This is the players, this is the rules, and that's almost final. Changing the Constitution can be done, but it's tricky. Um, I don't know how it works in the US. In Canada, if you wanna change the Constitution, you need, they use something called the 750 rule. And so you need seven of the provinces to agree to it. And those seven provinces have to represent at least 50% of Canada's population to make a constitutional change. That's the, minimum. That's the minimum. So if you don't have that, it doesn't happen. We've attempted to change our constitution a couple of times in the past um, because when our constitution came home, because it used to be in the British Parliament, and so when it came home in 1982, just shockingly late, but when it came home in 1982, um, Quebec did not sign on to it. So Quebec, there are things in the constitution that the province of Quebec doesn't like. And so they said, we're not signing on, we don't like this. It doesn't really matter for all intents and purposes, they have to live under it, but they don't like it. And so at two points in our history, Canadian prime ministers have tried to change the constitution to make Quebec more happy and get Quebec to sign on to it. Um, so there was lots of discussion, there was lots of conferences, there was a referendum at one point, and basically none of it added up to anything. So they weren't able to, the, the provinces weren't able to agree. So again, changing the constitution can be done. I don't know how it's done in the United States, but it is not easy. And so for, for someone like Donald Trump, it is all but impossible for him to change the Constitution at this, at this point, uh, and, and certainly in a way that would allow him to stay in power. Of course, if you're a dictator with the army behind you, you just tear up the Constitution and do whatever you want, and nobody can stop you. But if you still live in a democratic society, you have to follow it. And the Constitution says that as of January 20th, he's, he's done. And so nothing, nothing will stop that now, fortunately for all of us. Um, okay, so I'm glad we have that decided. So I have, um, I have a call that I kind of need to get onto in about, um, in about five minutes or so. So I'm gonna, let you, I'm gonna let you all go. That was a decisive book close. Um, come back on Monday, we will continue with the Cold War and we'll try to move toward wrapping it up. We've got a 
we've got a compressed time schedule. I'm not even sure if we'll get to China here, but we'll, we'll try. So that's all for today. Thank you for our, this little experiment in democracy, people. Have a good weekend, and I'll see you on Monday.